right. Hey, what's up, everybody? We made it. Yep, another one. FST coming your way, Fantasy Sports Today. Mad Striker here. Sam, why the sports guy pushing the buttons behind the glass? And of course, the reason we all tune in at this point in the trip is the one and only Joe Pizzapia. Now, I know you recognize that name if you're new to the show. Joe's an author. He's also a prevailing voice in the industry. He's the greatest guy to sit down with a week before it all counts and make it happen. So, Joe, we got you locked up for the next couple of hours. How are you, my man? Oh, I'm good because this is literally the last preview show that I have to do. And I have to say the last six months of previewing this NFL season and people say, what do you mean six months? Well, because for fantasy pros, football never stops. We're always doing football shows. We're doing the draft. We're doing all these other things going on. We've been talking fantasy for months and months and months, getting everybody ready for their drafts. And here we are in sports grid doing the same thing, but this is it. We've got real football starting on Thursday. And that my friends, is why we're all here. And I know a lot of people have drafts today. I know Labor Day weekend, it's a very popular time for drafts. We've got people who like to always annually draft on that Monday of Labor Day. So it's fun for you. And it's your last chance to wear white everybody too, because after Labor Day, that's a fashion no-no. Matthew Stryker has told me that many times. I almost wore a white shirt today, in fact, Matt. And I was like, you know what? It's pushing the envelope. It's a little close. But yes, we're here. Traditions are important. News is important too. So let's get to the headlines. Let's start with Michael Gallup whose rehab is going, quote, very smoothly, end quote. And that's a good thing for the Dallas Cowboys. There was fear that Michael Gallup would probably end up uh, starting the year on the pop list. That is not going to happen. So how much Michael Gallup can contribute right away in terms of snap count, in terms of receptions, is still yet to be seen. But the good news is his ADP in drafts is still very, very low. And he is still locked in right now as the number two wide receiver on a Cowboys offense that was quite good last year. So Gallup is one of these late round value wide receivers that might not help you too much in September, but might be a good investment and a good return on that investment in drafts right now, as he's currently going very late still. Uh, Philadelphia's Miles Sanders is dealing with a hamstring injury. Uh, he returned to practice on Thursday, but monitor this very closely. If you have other options here in week one, I would look to them. Uh, Miles Sanders draft stock has fallen. Last year was a down year. Zero touchdowns for Miles Sanders last year. It was not a good uh, year for the touchdowns for the Miles Sanders. But this year he's got some competition. Kenneth Gainwell still there uh, looking to uh, eat into the workload a little bit in terms of especially the receiving downs. And Boston Scott's still there also. So be very careful if you proceed with caution to that Philadelphia backfield. The Washington Commanders, Brian Robinson, was officially placed on the uh, NFI list. Uh, so that is um, basically he is inactive. It's because of the oddness of the injury they're not going to hurt the washington commanders in terms of their roster space so that's a good thing but uh also a good thing for brian robinson it seems like the recovery is going well there's been talk about potentially november but again i wouldn't hold your breath right now this season for brian robinson if you're looking to draft this weekend and finally russell wilson gets the big deal matt striker 245 million dollar extension that is about 244 million dollars more than your extension here at sports grid so i just want to <laughs> check with you and see what do you think about uh the denver broncos locking up russell wilson long term this is his home he hasn't played a game there yet but he's going to play a lot of games here theoretically over the rest of his career so is it time to to ride with the denver broncos and russell wilson he does love the let's ride <laughs> so here's the thing. If you're the Denver Broncos sitting up there in those smoky offices <laughs> and you ask yourself, what's coming down the line? And if whatever's coming down the line, and no one can say that, but in some of these drafts, look, college football just started. Everyone's all on that. that what is that kid? CJ Stroud. Oh my God. You don't know what things are going to be like in two, three years. Broncos said to themselves, welcome in our radio audience. This is FST. It's fantasy sports today. You've heard all about it. Now experience it. Matt Stryker and Joe Pizzapia. The question posed to me was, the thought on Russell Wilson locking in a long-term deal with the Denver Broncos. Look, we're a week ahead of the season. People are still drafting. This is the show. At SportsGrid, at SportsGrid TV are the social media handles. But the answer to the question is simple. The Broncos looked at the field ahead and said, what's better? Is something better coming down the line or the devil you know versus the devil you don't? So I think they locked up Russell Wilson. They said, this is the best we're going to get. We're going to be able to compete. And I'm all in on this team. I think a lot of people are. I've seen a lot of drafts. You see Sutton and Judy going really, really quickly off of the board also because there's that wide receiver mentality. Russell Wilson is fun. There's a lot of weapons on this football team. People are going to be watching this football team. So I think it just makes fiscal sense for the Broncos mm -hmm. as well as competitive sense to uh, lock Wilson up. 
Yeah, uh, I mean, there's a lot of expectations. It's going to be a very competitive division. It's kind of fun in week one that he gets the Seahawks, too. Oh, the <laughs> irony of the scheduling. It's so marvelous, isn't it? In prime time, no less, we get all of that. Uh, but I, I'm with you. I, I think that, you know, if you're looking for um, an actual franchise quarterback in the NFL, they are few and far between, believe it or not. They really are. There's about a dozen of them. And then after that, you're trying to figure out if you have one or if you can get by with what you got. And Russell Wilson's been to a few Super Bowls. Russell Wilson's won a Super Bowl. Russell Wilson has now a full complement of weapons, a good defense, a good run game. He's got all the support, a new head coach. He's got all these things right there in front of him. And I understand, you know, sometimes people, relationships fray. You know, we had Pete Carroll and Russell Wilson had a lot of good years together. But clearly this was time for a change for everybody and philosophies being what they are. I'm actually surprised this day in the modern day NFL that, Pete Carroll got his way or the Seahawks decided that their way would be to part with the franchise quarterback as opposed to let's just do everything the franchise quarterback wants instead because that's a little harder to find but this is the modern day NFL anything can happen and today we're going to go through the fantasy previews for you so if you got your drafts coming up today tonight all of the above tomorrow or even right up until the start of the season we're going to go position by position talk about my ranks versus the ADP the average draft position break it all down for you right here on fantasy sports today get ready sports grid your 24-7 sports wagering network. In the landscape of college sports, some things remain the same. College That's football the today. Alabama in winning SEC champions. It's the island of misfit tour. Fantasy sports so today. You have to understand that. $4 word. gap between them and Kansas City. Pro football now them today. Years when this happened to this franchise, they are comical. Now, I'm not making light of the injuries. This is a brutal rash of in injuries. Game line, but you can take all the access. points. You can take the money line. And the sports book, if you shop around, you can get it at 133. But um, that's my best bet on the night, Joe. So that's the one I'm going big. In game go. live, prime time. I'm going a bit nostalgic. I'm going with an international, Jason Day and Sergio Garcia. But boy, you want to give me eight and a half points with a desperate team facing elimination? Get the winning edge only on Sports Grid, your 24/7 sports wagering network. they sent out a Jordan Montgomery who evidently is the best pitcher in baseball. I know it's the Cubs. I don't care. But it looks like maybe word is getting out that, you know what? We don't really have an offensive coordinator. Why don't you guys get used to calling real plays with real players in the game and see if we can work something out over, let's just say, the first half. The early line only on Sports Grid. The Bostonian versus the book. My name is Matt Peralt. I'm the Bostonian. Introducing our one and only. He is the book. One Mr. Dave Sherapan. Now we've got the beat behind it, unfortunately. The Bostonian versus the book. Sports professor Rick Haro and so the $1.3 trillion business of sports with your Sports News Minute. Gambling progress in Albania. Yeah, we owe it to our viewers to talk about other countries as well. Three years ago, they were just like Eastern Europe and the rest of Europe and the U.S. after the Supreme Court decision, as prolific as they possibly could be to maximize revenue and the like. 2019 change of administration, politics ground to a halt, and the legal issues as well. And since the state controls all of the internet, and all of the media, they went from having necessity of gambling to totally illegal almost overnight. Well, what does it take? International pressure, the big companies, Albanians robust population, and maybe more important than anything else, they need the money like everybody else. So just as quickly as it evaporates, if you want to bet and go to Albania, you're going to be successful.
Hey, welcome back in FST Fantasy Sports today. You ever have something circled on your calendar or you have a thought in your head, you're looking forward to something. The next thing you know, it arrives. And you say to yourself, wow, you know, that time is a strange thing, no matter how much it happens to us in our lives, Joe. We're always, we always marvel at it. So here we are. I've had this circled right here on my format for three weeks, even though I held up four. It's the ranks. It's Joe's <laughs> ranks. It's a perfect time to really see where everything lays out. So Joe Pizzapia, let's start with your quarterback ranks i am ready go well look it's not always just about ranks too it's about strategy and attacking the position so if you're in a 10 team league that's a single quarterback league you can wait on quarterback there's plenty of supply and demand that's all there in your favor okay so you don't have to go quarterback early unless the scoring is completely bizarre in a 12 team league you have options uh, i am not against the early option of taking josh allen i think it's perfectly fine if you can get him at a good value i don't think the second round is that value Maybe the beginning of the third, or if you're at the turn, and you start off Jonathan Taylor, and if you got a big time wide receiver, you say, "Ah, yeah, screw it, I'm going to get three of the top guys at their respective positions." You could do a lot worse. Now, as you look here, these are my ranks, so I have Josh Allen at the top. But if you want to wait and let quarterback come to you in a 12 team, you can do that also, and we're going to talk our way through that and how to do that. So my ranks right now have got Josh Allen as the number one quarterback, followed by Justin Herbert, Patrick Mahomes at three, Lamar Jackson at four. Tom Brady at five. Let's stop here with the top five for a moment because uh, Lamar Jackson, you got to put him back into that category. Um, a lot of people, it's funny, have soured on Mahomes. But the interesting thing about that is it's more about the unknown than it is about Mahomes. It's about what are these weapons like? What's a Kansas City offense is like? And I have seen Mahomes draft stock very greatly, maybe more than any other player that is considered elite. In every draft I've done, Mahomes' value has just been all over the all over the map, all over the board, whether it be in expert league drafts or even just casual drafts uh, with other folks. I can tell you the Mahomes one is fascinating. You might be able to get Mahomes at a discount, and it might very well look like, say, Drew Brees in his peak where he was just wow. making all of the tools around him useful and just throwing for 5,000 yards anyway because he was just looking for the open man and playing quarterback at a high-level position. So he doesn't necessarily need Tyreek Hill to be Patrick Mahomes. And I think that's something that has really kind of dinged his value a little bit in a lot of minds in the public perception. If you're looking at the rest of this board too, Lamar Jackson's that guy that brings that rushing equity. The guy that brings everything, of course, is Josh Allen, which is why it's okay to go and be the one first off the board. But once that first quarterback does fly off the board in a single quarterback league, you kind of have, you, know, you can set your clock right about to the next round of probably Herbert, probably Mahomes right around after that. Lamar has gone back up in draft boards as he should because he brings that rushing equity. He can rush for 1,000 yards and I think throw for 3,500 or maybe even 4,000 if things break right this year. Uh, Tom Brady, still elite. I mean, until he's not, he is. I, and I know that sounds like I'm oversimplifying things, but I'm not because it's Tom Brady and he's got a ton of weapons. And if this is his last year in the sun, He's going to try to go out with a bang and don't tell him he's too old and don't tell him no, because if you keep telling Tom Brady, no, he's just going to keep rubbing your face in it. After this, Joe Burrow is a fascinating one. We're going to talk more about Joe Burrow later in the show too, but you know, Joe Burrow last year put up really good numbers and he did it with far fewer pass attempts than say Ben Roethlisberger or another couple guys. He is due for another 80 pass attempts this year, at least. And if that is the case, my goodness, with that better offensive line, Joe Burrow really deserves a little bit more credit. He's another one that falls and drafts a little bit. I have him as my QB six, but Joe Burrow typically is going at seven or even after eight or nine in some other people's boards. Dak Prescott at seven, Kyler Murray at eight. Uh, a lot of people are higher on Kyler Murray than I am, Matt, but really it's because for me, Kyler Murray, although he brings the, the rushing equity, although he brings the passing equity as well in that unique combination, the problem is the smaller frame. Two years ago, he had some injuries with the shoulder. He had a month where he really just didn't play like Kyler Murray. And then last year, missed some time too. So the smaller frame and the style of play kind of concerned me a bit. Then we have Jalen Hurts, who broke out last year, was QB8, brings the rushing equity, brings that point total. He has A.J. Brown now. That's a huge win. Trey Lance is kind of the cheaper version of him. So you can look at Jalen Hurts as a guy you can get probably in the sixth, seventh round, somewhere around there, maybe even eighth in your drafts. But Trey Lance, you get even later on the board. And then if you do take Trey Lance, I would recommend taking a second quarterback just to give yourself a little insurance in case he struggles early. Russell Wilson at 11, Kirk Cousins at 12. Cousins grossly undervalued last couple of years. Slow starts historically in September. Last year, he bucked that trend and it had a really positive impact. 
to me, I think this new coaching staff and this new offense can bring a lot to Kirk Cousins' fantasy value. So those are the top 12. I know some names are missing from it, but what do you think of this top 12, Matt? What sticks out to you? Well, first of all, it's fantastic. And a lot of people kind of dismiss the top tiers and go, yeah, 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 yeah. I don't need you to tell me about Josh Allen and so on and so forth. But at the same time, you do. You talk about reaching. Um, I think Allen is the one guy worth reaching for. But uh, if some people have a fandom, then they can argue for, you know, Mahomes or even Jackson. But here's the thing. You have to start looking at the weapons. You mentioned Mahomes and you brought up some great points about where he sits in different drafts. The weapons have changed. Don't think that they've changed in a way that's negative. I mean, Juju Smith-Schuster is there now. When you start to think about how the game can change now, think about how Mahomes plays the game. And we've talked about this, how pockets break down, how plays collapse, how receivers keep a play alive. Now think about it. Now is Mahomes worth it to reach? And then you mentioned Lamar Jackson. Um, if you miss on Lamar Jackson, you made a great point. There is, uh, There are other Lamar Jacksons later on in the draft, mm -hmm. poor man's versions. But I think the Russell Wilson at the bottom there is a great play. It, it, he's at your 11th ranked quarterback and you're sitting in your draft late and, and you say, you know what? Russell Wilson, and even Kirk Cousins. He, he might not be attractive, but when you look at the other end of the football for Kirk Cousins, then you can start to see his value because you can see the right. atlas and you can see what he can offer you. So that's how I approach the top tier here. But I think it's smart to think about, is it worth it to reach for a quarterback or not? A, fandom, and B, the quarterback's weapons. Now let's get into you know separating the boys from the men because when you get into these second and third <laughs> tiers, this is where your knowledge becomes absolutely priceless. Well, look, Superflex to me is where it's at. This is what you want to be playing. And you'll see on this Superflex list here when we go to the QB2s, a lot of established names, Matthew Stafford, Aaron Rodgers, names that we're very familiar with. Um, these are some of the guys that I would say if you're going to take Trey Lance and take that gamble that you back yourself up with, one of those kind of guys because you know they're stable and you know what you're getting. I think Derek Carr is one of those guys. Threw for 4,800 yards last year without Devontae Adams, without a whole lot of help around him. Uh, now you bring in Devontae Adams to this offense with somebody who like Josh McDaniels, an offensive mind like that. Derek Carr has big-time upside this year. Uh, his expected touchdown total last year should have been in the mid-30s for Derek Carr. Instead, it was just 23. So expect that to change. Uh, Justin Fields is another one of those poor man's versions of the rushing quarterback, too, where it might not always look pretty, but the fantasy points are going to be there because he does have a big arm and he can certainly run the football. I'm looking for Trevor Lawrence at number 17 here, too, to have a, a good second season and build on you know some of the moments you saw last year. He was just in a terrible set of circumstances. Uh, in Superflex Leagues, I also think Matt Ryan is a safe second option. If you go really early quarterback and then you want to load up on wide receiver and running back, I think it's okay to go with Matt Ryan. Mac Jones is safe too. Then you get into the bottom tier, which is very questionable. Ryan Tannehill coming off a down year where he threw a lot of picks. Tua and Tonga Vailoa and the new offense around him certainly has upside, but we've seen downside with Tua also. Jared Goff, safe but uninspiring. Jameis Winston, uh, possibly inspiring but highly unsafe. So my advice to people in Superflex is to take care of your business early if you can. Uh, I I hate when you say, oh, I want to get a quarterback in this round and a quarterback in that round. No, no. What I like to do, Matt, is try to get two quarterbacks in the first four rounds. However that works out in terms of my draft position, wow. that's what I'd like to do in theory. And then let the draft come to you. That, to me, is the approach. If there were two quarterbacks on the back end here that you could bump up, who would they be? Well, look, I think that the guys that might outperform where their rank is is Justin Fields and Trevor Lawrence because of their athleticism, because of the youth they have still, and because I do believe they get a little suppressed off of, let's face it, bad rookie seasons last year. So these are guys with enormous talent. These are guys who came with high draft capital last year in the NFL draft. Trevor Lawrence is still a, uh, I would say, a generational quarterback talent, and I'm not ready to write him off, but Fields and Lawrence, those are the guys you could say, I can get a little bit more with these guys, and they might go after Matt Ryan, who is more of an established name that people recognize. So in Superflex, address your quarterbacks early because I'm telling you, when you get into that second tier, it gets a little tricky. Running back, we return right here on FST.
the early line. See how quickly they fired Tom Thibodeau. Because I don't know if he's a part of the decision-making there, but we heard rumors that he would have rather traded R.J. Barrett than, say, someone like Quinton Grimes. I mean, he would have traded for Donovan Mitchell and benched him for the entirety of the fourth quarter because Derrick Rose would have gone on a heater. There's too many question marks for me on the Knicks to make a deal like this. I think Knicks fans should actually be happy this morning. Only on Sports Grid. Are you looking for an edge for football betting this year? What if you could get insider knowledge from former team doctors about the injury mismatches every week? That's exactly what Sports Injury Central can give you. They're going to tell you what games to bet based on the hidden injury advantages. So their team of doctors will provide the data and their algorithm will tell you which games to bet. Against the spread, overs, unders, in-game bets, and prop bets. Sick Picks has it all. So take advantage of their 59% winning percentage over the last two seasons and sign up today. But I think truly this is where we're going to find out whether Tua is the guy in Miami. And obviously there's a guy named Lamar Jackson that's sort of now waiting in the wings to be a free agent in a couple of weeks. As bizarre as it was, it was Superman realizing that he's Clark Kent and he walks the earth with, earth with other humans. So um, I don't make too much of it. I think Anthony Joshua now has to embark on a new path for his career. Newswire, only on Sports Grid. Sports Grid, your 24 7 sports wagering network. They play less games. The early line. Take a look at the top four seeds here in the Big Ten. They're going to play Aaron less Rogers games. And the morning the after. Wilson. We saw movement in the marketplace like Orlando. Fantasy Magic. Sports the Today. The Cavaliers are a little thin as well. Newswire. Minus 160 favorite on the money line today for Arizona. Pharrell, and coast to BBG, coast. That's where they win cups. Stanley Cups over there. Give me the game penalty. time decision. Kind of bizarre when you consider like so everybody is out for the Warriors. In game Every live all like access. Mandy. I like Mandy against Bam. I think Mandy can win the game, take a corner. In half. game oh, live man. prime oh, time. The major, the PGA champion. In yes. game live overtime. All done before the final bet. Get the game. winning edge only on Sports Grid. <laughs> Welcome back in. This is FSG Fantasy Sports Today. The conversations that go on off the air just as good as the conversations on the air. To be honest, nothing changes. My name is Matt Stryker. His name is Joe Pizzapia. We're talking football and we're having fun. It's about to be Labor Day. There's still a few people out there that have some drafts and then the happiest day of the year, it all begins. But before that, Joe, for me, the happiest day of the year is when I sit down with you and we rank positions. We did quarterbacks. Now let's do running backs, all right? Because this is something that is a very, very controversial topic. A lot of people want to hear what you have to say. Well, a lot of people are also going to want to hear that at the break, Matt said that when I win him a fantasy championship, he's going to take me on a trip to Hawaii. Just the two of us. Just a bros trip. We're going to go there. We're going to wear the shirts. We're going to wear the lays. We're going to have, you know, pink drinks with umbrellas in there. It's going to be fabulous. It's going to be a bros vacation. I can't wait till you win all those fantasy leagues. I don't Let's need to win a fantasy league for us to do that, bud. <laughs> we we got to go. A couple of awesome. Times. All right. Well, <laughs> there you go. Just let everybody know January. That's where we'll be doing the show from that. That's the location. Can somebody talk to Cardano and get him on the line and tell him that Matt and I want to do on location in January this show. I mean, that seems like a reasonable request, I think. All right, let's get to the running backs here and the top of the board. It's no surprise uh, for me anyway. I know a lot of people have been back into the business of Christian McCaffrey, which feels like a Ponzi scheme to me, honestly. Like, I, I just don't, I don't understand it. I don't get it. You've given me the entire board and you're telling me that people are ready to take Christian McCaffrey as the number one overall again. I'm not, I'm not there. I'm not ready to do it. I'm not saying Christian McCaffrey can't finish as the number one overall. I'm not saying he's not a special player. I'm saying is this Christian McCaffrey has played 10 games in two years. If I have the entire board in front of me, that's not a risk I need to take to win a league. It is the kind of risk that can lose you a league. Trust me, I've had McCaffrey in a few leagues here and there over the last couple of years. It's no fun. It's not a good time. And people would say, well, then that you have a bias because you had this player. No, 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 no. 
I'm trying to educate you from bad experiences. You know, it's kind of like that scared straight program. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to have you here, sit here in the fantasy jail with me and tell you about why you shouldn't do something because it's a bad idea. And that's how I ended up in jail. And I don't want you to end up in jail. So learn from the mistakes. It's not that Christian McCaffrey isn't great. It's not that he's not the number one overall talent running back in terms of theory of fantasy. But at the same time, you don't have to do it to win. So I'm not going to. I still have at my number one, Jonathan Taylor, regardless. If I'm going to take a second running back, which honestly, once you give me the number two pick, I'm taking Justin Jefferson. I've already been very clear about that all year on every show. But if you were looking at the running back rankings, Derrick Henry, I still have two and a half point PPR. In full PPR, I would move Dalvin Cook ahead of Henry. These are half PPR rankings. Christian McCaffrey at four, I think is perfect. Now I've got DeAndre Swift very hot. Uh, higher than even consensus. Consensus has him at eight. I've got him at five. I'm buying into what the lines are doing. It has nothing to do with hard knocks. It has to do with how good Swift was when he was catching the football and what he was doing in that offense before the injury. Austin Eckler, look, Eckler is going to go ahead of Swift, but what I'm trying to tell you is that's okay. If you have an eighth pick, a ninth pick, a tenth pick, Swift is going to be on the board, and he's a lot closer to that top tier than people realize. I've knocked Najee Harris down just a peg because of the foot injury. I know they say he's fine, but foot injuries and running backs are typically not something I like to put together. Uh, Joe Mixon at number eight, Javante Williams at nine. Uh, If Melvin Gordon hadn't resigned, I guarantee you Javante Williams would be a top five guy for me. Uh, That's how strongly I feel about Williams. And I do believe it's going to be a 60-40, if not a 70-30 split in Javante Williams' favor. His offense is going to be a lot better with Russell Wilson. More moving of the chains means more scoring opportunities. That's a good thing for Javante Williams. So he is at the ninth spot for me. At 10, Alvin Kamara. A little unknown in terms of what's going on with that suspension. Is it happening? Is it not happening? It seems like it's not, but you never know. The NFL has a funny way of dropping things on you last minute. We've seen it happen in the past. And then at 11, he's gotten back into my good graces with a healthy camp and a new head coach. It's Saquon Barkley of the New York Giants. So I think Barkley right now, you can steadily get him at the beginning of the second round, maybe end of the first in certain drafts that are more geographically located towards the tri-state New York area. Maybe you pay a little bit of a premium, but mostly, you know, you've seen Saquon Barkley because of the injuries get suppressed. You don't get Christian McCaffrey suppressed value. Hmm. I don't know why we could talk about that for days, but Saquon Barkley is going into value. He has just as much upside of Christian McCaffrey and I don't have to pay it. I get it probably in the second round. And then Nick Chubb is just safe. He is safe. He is good at football. Is the offense going to be great with Jacoby Brissett? No, but at the same time, you know what Nick Chubb is, and I think you can lock him in. And Nick Chubb is another guy, too, that's going a little later than he should. So those are the RB1s for me. Matt, what are your takeaways from this list here, or who did I leave out? Well, as far as who you left out, I'll let social media fight that out, you know, far be it from me yeah, to say. Yeah, let's uh, go social media. <laughs> when you mentioned Chubb and, and some of these other lower-ranked running backs and quarterbacks, you start to think of their offensive line. So I think it's due diligence to go out there and look up who the top five, 10 offensive lines. And I think Cleveland ranks up there as well as Philadelphia. So that, that would give Chubb just a bit more. But out of these 12, I think it's very intriguing, Joe, that there are at least four that I personally would be comfortable with, obviously with Taylor, obviously I, with you on Swift as well. Also because I, I like, I think people are going to sleep on Goff. I think Amon Ross St. Brown is good. I think it's going to open things up and for order for all that to work, DeAndre Swift is going to have to excel. And then if you miss on a Taylor or a Swift, you can wait a couple, two, three more, and then Javante Williams, because I'm with you on that as well. I have several teams that look like Taylor and Williams in the backfield. And last but not least is Saquon Barkley. And I think that it's the same McCaffrey mindset, and you, you touched on it. You were good X years ago. Why are you not good now? And in this day and age where there's always a new phone, there's always a new something, things that are two, three years old are still very good and very valuable, but people just forget them because they're not the new kid in school. Now you ask me who you left off. So here we go, because I know you're going to hear it from everyone out there. And just a reminder, at SportsGrid, at SportsGrid TV, and Joe, you can find him personally, at Joe Pizzapia17. Mm-hmm. He loves all this stuff. Let's go to the second half of your QB rankings, keeping in mind half PPR, and start to really find some value here. Well, look, the RBs here at the you know second spot, a lot of people are referring to this as the RB dead zone, which I think is a big load of nonsense. It is the buzzword. Every single fantasy Twitter community place, everyone talks about the RB dead zone. There's some value to be had here. There's also some pitfalls. It is a combination of guys who have been at the dance a long time and guys who haven't been asked to dance yet, or at least with a full pine partner. So, I mean, this is the, the trick is knowing when to take the spots here. And I'm somebody who goes heavy wide receiver in drafts. Because to me, that's where the league is. 
That's where the value is. That's where the probably less injury risk is early in draft. So I'm a heavy wide receiver build person in my drafts. So these running backs are very important. And this grouping is extremely important. Now, Javante Williams is one of those guys in certain drafts is lasting, you know, pretty late in the second round. So if I come away with Chase or Jefferson early, Javante Williams is my first running back I'm good with. And I could back it up with one of these guys if it's a, you know, a really running back heavy format. Leonard Fournette at 13. Most people have him as an RB1. I have him right outside just because of the age. And just, you know, it's another year older in that running back room and just happens sometimes. Uh, Aaron Jones, same thing. He's got company with A.J. Dillon. He's kind of had his three-year window. He's been in the league now six years. It's going to be a sixth season. Typically, that's the decline period. Aaron Jones had some injuries last year. We had Pat Fitzmaurice on last week on the show talking about A.J. Dillon and how good he looked towards the end of last year and how that worm almost seemed like it was turning a little bit in Green Bay. Not that Jones isn't going to be useful. Do I want to spend a second-round pick on him, though? Or a fourth or fifth round pick on A.J. Dillon? I want to spend the fourth or fifth round pick on A.J. Dillon. James Conner, 18 touchdowns last year. Incredible at the number 15 spot for me. Can he repeat that? Probably not. Can he get to 13 or 14? Probably. It's all about health for him. Ezekiel Elliott at 16. My, how the mighty have fallen, but still a name brand value that is still going to carry weight in most of your casual drafts. If he comes to you at RB2, great. As an RB1, you're nuts. He is not an RB1 mm -hmm. anymore. Uh, but at the same time, can he be a steady RB2 if you're in a heavy wide receiver start? Sure. Of course he can. You know he's still going to be part of this team, part of this offense, because they're paying him. Pay attention to the contracts of these guys, too. That matters. Travis Etienne, pay attention to him. This is where things get sexy here. Number 17, Jacksonville Jaguars on my list. Now, this guy brings a lot of passing ability, pass catching ability, excuse me, to the table. He has got a built-in rapport with Trevor Lawrence from their Clemson days. This is a guy I was very excited about last year, but unfortunately, injury happened. He is very removed from that knee surgery. He is healthy. James Robinson is not. He's coming back from that Achilles. Just because he's on the field and practicing doesn't mean he's 100%. So I'd still look for Travis Etienne. A.J. Dillon, another guy, too. We've sung his praises on the show the last few weeks. This is a big deal. Uh, then we've got Cam Akers at 19. Good offense. J.K. Dobbins at 20. Um, who I think is still going to eat quite a bit. Then you had Damian Pierce, who's flown up draft boards. I am at 21. He's still typically going at RB30, but if he's getting all the workload, that's where I want to be. Chase Edmonds at 22 with the Miami Dolphins. That's another player, too, that looks like, you know, that Sonny Michelle's out of town, maybe a little bit more of the backfield to himself. Josh Jacobs at 23, and at 24, Antonio Gibson, who is now back in the good graces because of Brian Robinson's injury. And to close things out here, the RB3 list, let's fly through these and talk about the guys to pick out. At 25, Brees Hall with the Jets, still unknown in terms of talent is there. How much is he going to split with Michael uh, Carter? Tony Pollard, pass catching back. And PPR, he's a great pivot if you wait on running back. Uh, same can be said of Ramondre Stevenson. Harris at 27, Stevenson at 28. Stevenson typically goes after Harris. In the sharper drafts, Stevenson goes ahead of Harris. Keep that in mind. Kareem Hunt at 29. Still is going to catch passes. Again, more valuable in the PPR format. Singletary at 30. Might be in a work committee there in Buffalo, but still probably the best of that group. Rashad Penny has at least a clean start to the season. We'll see if he can stay healthy. I'm very low on Montgomery compared. I'm high on Khalil Herbert, who's at 36. And then you got Melvin Gordon, Miles Sanders, guys that to me don't really move the needle. And Eli Mitchell, who I pointed out last week, is a huge potential bust. So look in this RB3 tier for the guys who catch passes. That enhances their fantasy value. And if you start out early at wide receiver and you need to make up ground, it's the Pollards, it's the Stevensons, it's the Kareem Hunts of the world that can get it done. And they could take a shot with a single Terry or Rashad Penny and hope that what you saw last year can carry itself over into 2022. Because last year, those guys won a lot of people leagues. We come back, we're going to talk about the wide receiver rankings and how that can win you a league too. It's a wide receiver world, baby. And we're just living in it right here on Fantasy Sports Today on Sports Grid. might be the next daily fantasy millionaire no matter what you watch or where you play learn from the world's best dfs players lineup building tools expert projections and advanced stats change the way you play the game dominate the competition dailyroto.com the player's choice
the Bostonian versus the book. There's no exact yeah. science and numbers. Not, I don't know what numbers are sharp and what, what there aren't, like just in general. Yeah. But this is the great unknown. If you can know it, pick two teams and make a number every week and compare it to Maddie's and see where you're at. I mean, we got Betsmore in the chat. He's making his own numbers all the time. He's putting it in here. He's talking. Right. I can't wait to get this Mom, guy on the show. The Bostonian versus the book. If you want to pick like a pro, you need to be in the know. The future of sports gaming is now. And we take you inside the lines, breaking down all the action and what it means for your bet slip. Turn down the game and tune into Sports Grid Radio. Other networks talk sports talk, but we walk the walk right up to the window. Sports Grid Radio. Listen free on the Sports Grid Radio app, iHeart, or tune in, or catch us on Sirius XM Sports Grid Channel 159. Your heart's racing. The clock's running out. It all comes down to this. We're talking pregame. 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 Get locked in with game time decisions. Your hosts, Gabe Marinci and Cam Stewart, will get you ready for game time. Everything you need to know before a game goes off the board with the best lips to back it up. Make your best bet with live odds updates, late breaking news, up to the minute injury reports, and real time analytics from inside the sports books. All the odds, all the action from sports wagering insiders and industry pros like Donnie Wrightside, Cam Lou, Cousin Sal, the pro football doc, Dr. David Chow, and more. Get the winning edge every weekday afternoon from 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern, 3 to 4 Pacific. It's game time decisions only on Sports Grid. Welcome back. This is FST Fantasy Sports Today at the Sports Grid and at Sports Grid TV are the social media addresses. And during the break, Joe and I both scrolling through, seeing your comments. Uh, Joe, a lot more inclined to respond and to get into it with some of our listeners and viewers. But I think that that discourse and debate is something that's dying in the world. I think it's perfect, especially in fantasy football. You, you want to have these interactions. You want to have this type of back and forth so you can feel better about the decisions that you make. Joe, make us feel better about the wide receiver position. You've pounded the table for drafting mm-hmm. wide receivers early. Move away from this heavy running back mentality that has prevailed in fantasy football for so long. Defend your position and talk about some of the players and the reasoning why. Defend yourself. Well, I'll defend myself because the league has changed. I mean, look at what's going on here. Rookie Justin Jefferson a couple years ago, breaking records. Last year, Jamar Chase looking unbelievable. Cooper Cup going for almost 2,000 yards receiving. This is the league now. You have to understand this is the league now. Now, Cooper Cup won a lot of leagues because you drafted him in the fourth or fifth round last year and he gave you number one overall points. That, that, That doesn't happen every single year. So now that you have the ability to look at the board differently and how the NFL is evolving and where these passing yard totals are going. I mean, I did say earlier, a couple of segments ago, Derek Carr threw for 4,800 yards last year. People, <laughs> this is the league. Let's get on board and understand that, you know, the running backs by committee, the specialization of running back, all this stuff, it's the injury quotient in the last couple of years in the first round guys, it's been tough. It's not that you can't draft a running back first. It's just, you better have a plan. Uh, My plan for every draft is to take Justin Jefferson in the first round if he comes to me. That means with the one spot, maybe. I mean, definitely with the two spot. Three, four, five, six. If you're going to let him slip the six, I'm going to win the league. I'm telling you right now. Because I do believe Justin Jefferson is going to be the guy at the end of the year who is standing as the best fantasy asset there is. Uh, And if it's not him, then Jamar Chase has a, a chance to be right behind him. I think Chase is that special also. But it's also this Kevin McConnell offense and what they're going to do. If you look at the wide receiver ones here on my list, Jefferson at the top of the board, Jamar Chase two, Cooper Cup three. It's not a knock on Cooper Cup. It's just a little concern about the elbow of Stafford coupled with it's really hard to repeat a historic season. A cup season was historic. Number four, Devontae Adams. Yes, that Devontae Adams. I understand he's not with Aaron Rodgers anymore. I get it. He's super special. If you ask all the wide receivers in the league, who's the best wide receiver in the league? Most of them are going to tell you Devontae Adams still. Okay, let's not forget that. That's important. 
He makes guys around him better. Stefan Diggs at five, still a very solid investment. CD Lamb has an opportunity to really become that dude this year. He's at number six. AJ Brown at number seven. Efficiency is his game, and he is very good at it, and that's a good thing because Jalen Hurts is not a prolific passer. So really, it's just a matter of can he stay healthy, and can this Eagles offense step up a notch year over year? And I think the answer is yes. Uh, who is the wide receiver one after the first five weeks of the season last year before injury? It was Mike Williams of the Chargers, everybody. A lot of people forget that. Not me. This brain stores a lot of useless information, or maybe useful, depending on how you look at it. Mike Williams I've got higher than probably any other expert, quote-unquote, in the format. And I think Mike Williams is somebody you can draft probably as a wide receiver, too, who's going to finish as a wide receiver one. Debo Samuel at nine. Uh, we got Michael Pittman at 11, who had over 1,000 yards last year receiving with Carson Wentz. He's got a much better quarterback here, Matt Ryan. Matt Ryan is going to be much better year over year than he was last year with that awful offensive line behind him in Atlanta or in front of him, I should say. And then Keenan Allen, safety man at 12. And yes, I've got two chargers in the top tier, but that's yep. because Justin Herbert is a top tier passing quarterback. And that's just the identity of this team. But the problem with Keenan Allen is in PPR, he's very safe, but he lacks that touchdown upside. Mike Williams brings all of that to the table potentially. So those are the ones, again, Mike Williams, probably the big outlier, but Matt, what sticks out to you when you look at this list? Well, no, I'm actually with you on Williams and maybe I would just have Pittman ahead of him, but otherwise I can't really argue with, with the ranking. I do think Pittman's a little low and uh, with the chargers, it's okay to have two. And I think Palmer is actually someone you can think about as well as a wide receiver three or four, but we'll talk more about him later. If you miss on Joe's, you know, big three of Jefferson chasing Cup, I, I would really be happy with Stefan Diggs. I would not mind that at all. You mentioned Williams and I think Pittman as well. Keenan Allen could be a good supplement implementation if you think the offense is going to score that way joe said you know think about the quarterback this guy threw for this many yards and this guy is a very passing prolific offense and this coordinator likes to do this you always have to think about that but even more so when you get into the second tier of the wide receiver rankings in half ppr leagues because now there's so many you talked about the rb dead zone this year is a wide receiver alive zone go mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they were saying, uh, my colleague Matthew Friedman says, the RB dead zone is the wide receiver power alley, which is where you can really just clean up in the draft. So if you do take Dalvin Cook with your first pick, if you do take Derrick Henry, you're going to be looking at maybe Mike Williams, Pittman as your number one, that's fine. And then you're going to look at a lot of these guys too. Uh, Jalen Waddell, last year over 100 catches as a rookie. What an incredible first year for him. I know Tyreek Hill is there. That's okay. Jalen Waddle's still going to get his. Tyreek Hill, I have them right back to back. Hill's going to have some smash games. That's the nature of Tyreek Hill. But he only had half of his games last year as a wide receiver one. I think to me that knocks you out of wide receiver one conversation when you downgrade a quarterback from Mahomes to Tua, and then you factor that in as well. Cortland Sutton, I know a lot of my colleagues are very high on Cortland Sutton. I like him too, but I just want to be respectful a little bit of the value here. I, I want to just make sure we're not going too crazy with Cortland Sutton. But if you start... You know, running back early and you end up with, again, Mike Williams, Cortland Sutton. Those are the guys you're looking at. You're doing okay. Deontay Johnson, I think, is going to be fine. Uh, I think he's still going to get steady volume. Uh, maybe even, you know, potentially some bigger plays because Roethlisberger was very limited the last couple of years. Gabriel Davis, that's the big one to circle. More on him later in the show, but that's the big leaper year over year. He was somebody I was very high in last year uh, going into the season, and he unfortunately really didn't show you what he's capable of completely until – December, and then we all remember what happened in January, especially what happened in Kansas City. Uh, but he always had a nose for the end zone. Oh, he was good. Even his rookie season, catching touchdowns in the red zone area. So it's now wheels up for this guy because they've gotten rid of Emmanuel Sanders. They've gotten rid of Cole Beasley. He's the other dude here in this offense, and he can challenge Diggs. That's how good he is. Michael Thomas, healthy in camp, finally. This is a good spot for Michael Thomas at 18. At 19, T. Higgins. Uh, T. Higgins is going to be higher on a lot of lists. I'm okay with taking T Higgins ahead of guys. He's the safer option than some of these other dudes. That's fair. But I also think he's limited because of chase. That's the only problem. Uh, Brandon cooks again, safe, reliable, not a great offense, but you kind of know what you're getting at 20 at 21. Jerry Judy. If you don't get Sutton and you want a piece of the Denver offense, mm -hmm. the Judy's the pivot, Terry McLaurin at 2022 at 22, excuse me, uh, in 2022, DJ Moore at 23. Uh, also, I have him a little bit lower, I think than consensus, but, it's because I, at this point, until he becomes somebody other than 1,200 yards and four touchdowns, uh, that's who he is. And maybe Baker Mayfield's the guy to unlock him, but Baker Mayfield didn't unlock Odell Beckham Jr. 
So I don't know why we're going to think he's going to unlock DJ Moore all of a sudden with that coaching staff. And I'm on Ross St. Brown at 24. I'm putting some respect on his name because of the run last year. Some people don't respect him enough in PPR leagues. If you can get him as your three, I love it. I prefer him as a wide receiver three than a wide receiver two, but he's right on that cusp. So uh, in your opinion, is there somebody maybe out of place here at wide receiver two? Uh, no. I, I, and there's a lot of players that I like. I like uh, St. Brown. I like, I like Terry McLaurin part and parcel because I like Carson Wentz. Uh, Jerry Judy, yep, you mentioned if you want to be in on the Russell Wilson thing. Michael Thomas sitting there, again, this is another player that a few years ago, hey, weren't you good? <laughs> you know, people come up to, hey, didn't you used to be Matt Stryker? Yes, you know, now I'm just mad on a Wednesday. Uh, Gabe Davis, a lot of people are on. And we, we talk about like pivots and stuff. And a few drafts that I did, I missed out on Davis. And then I found myself much later on with like Isaiah McKenzie. So I just felt a little bit better. And last but not least, when you look at the, the top tier of the second tier, you're going to find that Cortland Sutton is going to take the place of other receivers. And maybe six weeks into the season, and then again at the end, we can come back and look and see who could have been taken in Sutton's spot. Because it's always a very intriguing situation with Cortland Sutton. All right, now into the third tier. And I see a lot of names here that, again, are going to be viable. If people want to wait, they can get a bunch of upside wide receivers. Talk about a few here in this third tier. Viable, yes. Volatile, yes. Also, that's the trick with this group in here, and why, which is why they're wide receiver threes. Elijah Moore, 25, has all the talent in the world for the Jets. Uh, but limitations potentially depending on the quarterback situation. Let's be honest. I know last year he, he was great with Josh Johnson and, and Mike White at times, but that's still a lot to put on a young wide receiver. I still love the talent as a three. I'm in uh, Chris Godwin. The health is getting better, but now it's crowded. Russell Gage, Julio Jones, a lot of other guys to compete with for targets. How's that going to work out? I don't know. That's why he's a three for me. Rashad Bateman, to me, he's got the talent upside of a high end two. I love Rashad Bateman. Give me Rashad Bateman. Great hands, great route runner, smart kid. Injuries really derailed his rookie season. Look for him to be a, a guy you get a good return on this year. Marquise Hollywood Brown, a lot of people like him. I'm lower than consensus. What else is new? He doesn't catch the ball very well. When you're a receiver, you got to catch the football. Uh, also, when Hopkins comes back, what happens to Brown? I don't know. I don't like things I don't know. Plus, Rondo Moore has a lot of explosive talent. What happens with him? I don't know. I don't like unknowns when it comes to fantasy. DK Metcalf at 29. I've got DK too low. I I'll be honest with you. I've got to move him back up the rankings. I just can't get past so, you know, Geno Smith and Drew Locke and what he might be playing with this year. It just makes me so upset. Uh, Hunter Renfro, very safe. Good guy to have, especially in the full PPR formats. Love him. Christian Kirk is also a good consolation prize in the full PPR. He is going to get a ton of targets this year. We're going to be very high on him on DraftKings, I can tell you this year. Juju Smith-Schuster, again, unknown. Is he going to look like the guy a couple years ago that seemed like an emerging star or the guy that can't stay on the field and just doing TikTok videos? I don't know. You don't know. Don't tell me you know because I don't know. Amari Cooper, I know he doesn't have Deshaun Watson for 10 weeks, so that's why he's at 33. Darnell Mooney, great talent, uh, but again, limitations potentially on what he could do. He's another guy that could rise up this list. Alan Lazard at 35, and then Drake London, 36. Lazard and London, I think, will have a lot of targets. The touchdowns become the question to how those offenses are going to run. So those are the wide receiver threes for me. Uh, Matt, I told you, for me, you know, London, Lazard, Mooney, that's a good grouping. Kirk and Renfro, and then Rashad Bateman, the one that really stands out to me, him and Elijah Moore. Those are the upside guys. But you can see wide receiver three is a very volatile group. It is, and it actually leans more. It flows into the wide receiver fours that we're going to get into. Mm -hmm. But when you look at the top portion of this list, you made good arguments for being against certain guys. When you mention, you talk about God, when you talk about Metcalf, a lot of people are applying that Metcalf Lockett quagmire from last year. Who's it going to be this week? To what's going to be in Denver now between Sutton and Judy? Yeah. So there's always these these you know these nervous butterflies. Oh, what's it going to be? What's it going to be? I like Hunter Renfro. I do like Christian Kirk. I, I do think Schuster is worth a shot. We talked about why Mahomes would have some value. Well, you look at the new weapons that he has, and I'm in on Mooney. I was in on Mooney last year as well, and I think it's a good way to get tied to Justin Fields, a quarterback that you endorse that that could be sleeper esque. And then Drake London. And the joke that I made to you is it's one of the best professional wrestling names I've ever heard. But at the it end is. of the day, if he can be healthy and be out on the field. He really is poised for some, at least some projected value. All right, now let's move into the wide receiver four here. And you, you start with Adam Thielen. We're in 2022 and Adam Thielen I am. is your wife. Well, I mean, you know, he's older. He's 
time last year. I mean, those are good reasons uh, to to downgrade a player a little bit. And KJ Osborne looked really good last year. So 37 is not you can't take Thielen, but he is more of a fringy wide receiver three than he is the two that you're used to taking a couple of years ago. Same with Allen Robinson. Same thing. Um, yeah, there's every reason I believe he has upside, but there's also that downside. What if Stafford's elbow is bad? What if Allen Robinson is really just toast after last year and it was just, you know, A.J. Green 2.0 all over again? Brandon Ayuk is the guy, along with Kadarius Tony, of big upside. Tyler Lockett, again, you got to knock him down a peg. Chris Olave, another player to really watch. But Devontae Smith, Robert Woods, Devontae Parker, Rondell Moore at 46, Julio at 47, and George Pickens has moved up to top 50 in my range too. Right around 50 is DeAndre Hopkins. Again, six weeks is too long for me. But Kadarius, Tony, Brandon, I, you guys, I could really break that this year. We come back. More fantasy sports today right after this. If Clemson wins the ACC once again with only a single loss on the record, I guarantee you the Clemson Tigers will be a member of the college football playoff this year. Right, taking the over on that one, to be quite honest with you, there's a lot of questions in Houston that they're still trying to figure out. It's a young team, and I think it's going to be kind of an up and down year for them. The morning after, only on Sports Grid. going to work out for him but I, I just don't see him being on the field nearly as much as he was last season maybe the touchdown numbers will, will have him in that tight end one category or his career he would have gotten out. I mean I guess he had 108 rushing yards but six rushing touchdowns in his career so it doesn't give you any upside there Carr to be honest for me just is not a guy I ever end up targeting fantasy sports today only on Sports Grid. Pharrell, coast to coast. Go with a 12 team college football playoff. It is expected to start in 2026. It is possible it starts before then, but there are a lot of details that need to be ironed out for that to happen, although they do want to see it happen as soon as possible. Now, apparently, this format, Scotty, will have the six highest ranked conference champions. The Sports Grid Network. Sports Grid, your 24 7 sports wagering network. In the landscape of college sports, some things remain the same. College National football today. Alabama and winning SEC champions. It's the Island of Misfit Tour. Fantasy sports so today. You have to understand that. $4 word. gap between them and Kansas City. Pro football now them today. Years when this happened to this franchise, they are comical. Now, I'm not making light of the injuries. This is a brutal rash of In injuries. Game line, but you take all the access. You can take the money line. And the sports book, if you shop around, you can get it at 133. But um, that's my best bet on the night, Joe. So that's the one I'm going big. In I'm game go. live, prime time. I'm going a bit nostalgic. I'm going with an international, Jason Day and Sergio Garcia. But boy, you want to give me eight and a half points with a desperate team facing elimination? Get the winning edge only on Sports Grid, your 24 7 sports wagering network. All right, welcome back in FST Fantasy Sports today. And folks, I'm going to pull back the curtain and let you know if you know you're on a good show when your producer in the break gets in Joe's ear to continue to ask fantasy football advice. It never ends. It never dies. Oof, that pumped me up. All right, Joe, you got a stat of the day if you close out hour one. What do you got for me? 
I do. And then we'll pull the curtain back and we'll talk about that advice in a second. But yeah, stat of the, de- stat of the day here is uh, for my buddy Andrew Erickson of Fantasy Pros. You can follow him on Twitter at Andrew Erickson underscore. Christian Kirk. Christian Kirk finished as a wide receiver three, top 36 or better in 63% of his games last season playing in Arizona. Same as Michael Pittman and Tyreek Hill. 18th best among wide receivers. Also finished as a top six weekly wide receiver twice. And that was playing alongside DeAndre Hopkins. Kirk's current ADP is wide receiver 41. I just talked about how I'm higher in consensus than Christian Kirk. He's going to get a ton of volume. You've seen already that in the short time of the preseason, his target share is enormous. It's approaching 30%. That's crazy. And right now, the consensus on DeAndre Hopkins, who we know is going to miss the first six weeks of the season, he is being drafted as wide receiver 35 and half PPR over on Fantasy Pros, and that's the consensus. I'll take Christian Kirk over him. I'll take Elijah Moore, Brandon Ayuk, Drake London, uh, let's see, Alan Lazard, maybe even Chris Olave, but Kadarius Tony, definitely yes. To me, you start taking DeAndre Hopkins when you start hitting the Russell Gage, Garrett Wilson tier outside of, you know, when you're approaching wide receiver 50, and it's a bunch of guys like Tyler Boyd who really don't change your, Tyler Boyd's not winning you a league, folks. He's not. Like, even if there's an injury, I don't know if he's going to be necessarily, you know, winning you a league. So DeAndre Hopkins, that to me is the territory to take D-Hop. He's a great talent, but he's been in the league for 10 years, and he's also had a lot of soft tissue injuries. Just because he comes back, you know, the first six weeks of the season doesn't mean he is still the DeAndre Hopkins we know and love from the past. Is he worth an investment? Sure. But not over guys in the first six weeks that can really help you get dubs. So that's how you value him. When we come back, hour two, we're going to value defenses, tight ends, and also ask the important fantasy roundtable questions. Stick around for hour two of Fantasy Sports today.